we have nothing else than our muse and our creative ideas of what this thing is supposed to sound like, you know? Which of these takes sounds like a record? That's producer, engineer, and mixer Dana Nielsen. Dana's studio experience has put him in the room with some of the top artists in pretty much any genre you can imagine. Talking about everybody from Adele and Bob Dylan to SZA in the Red Hot Chili Peppers. In this episode, we get into Dana's vocal production and editing philosophy. But if they do their, their thing and overall it's up here, I'm just gonna try to keep that shape, but, but bring it here. And if there's an issue, I'm just gonna- How to set up a session for success every time by dialing in a great headphone mix. When they put the headphones on, their ideal response is like sounds great you know like I, i'm good let's go you know that's that's like the goal why you should always be in record someone had a guitar in the room and they were playing a different chord that's what made it so awesome like so the secret wasn't the singing but it was something else going on and how your musical influences combine to give you your unique sound and taste as a producer there's probably records that were formidable in your own upbringing and life or current life that you think really move you and those become sort of the 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 template or the blueprint within your mind's ear as a producer. This one's a great hang, lots of engineering tricks for everything from vocals to live bands, as well as Dana's takeaways from working with the legendary Rick Rubin and how that approach to production has shaped his own work. So stick around for my interview with Dana Nielsen. Something that I really wanted to talk to you about is vocal production. I've mm -hmm. done potentially thousands of vocal sessions some where there's a dedicated vocal producer, some where there's not. So I've mm -hmm. seen the value that this can bring, but a lot of people have never had a chance to experience it. Why have a specific producer just for vocals? And what does that bring to a session, especially if you've got a great singer already? Mm. Well, let's see. I guess there's two parts to that, to that answer. One is I've never been that specific vocal producer role myself. I think I'm more a producer who loves working with vocalists. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, if somebody were to ask me to like, Hey, we got this, this awesome gig going on and it's being produced by so-and-so and so-and-so, and we want you to be the vocal producer for these vocal sessions. I'd be like, Oh yeah, cool. Let's talk, you know? Um, but it's not a, uh, you know, specific job, uh, that I get asked for, uh, apart from what is a regular, uh, all encompassing production, <laughs> right. project yeah. production. Yeah. But the second part, I guess, um, which I think if I can remember, uh, was just about, you know, working with vocalists and, and, the, and the tools and tasks and, and, uh, the job that's there. Uh, yeah, I love that stuff. And I think, it comes from, you know, being a singer. Uh, and my wife is also a very accomplished singer. We, she loves to, to remind people that in, in high school, uh, she was choir president and I was choir vice president. <laughs> <laughs> and we went to the same high school. Uh, so I was, um, you know. Were you guys together vice, then? Yes. Oh. Uh, yeah. Well, senior year. Yeah. Uh, epic. Um, okay. That's awesome. Anyway. It's, I, I love it. And I, uh, I will say like, I'm, I'm not in a session trying ever to, um, you know, sing too well or <laughs> do anything like that, but it, those skills are, are super helpful to be able to, um, when needed, uh, as a, as a sort of last resort to help, uh, help a singer find, a um, harmony line that works, you know, uh, and all these things, you know, as a producer, like I'm always trying to get the artist to find their own way and offer suggestions to lead them toward, uh, toward something. So right. that's why I say as a last resort, you know, uh, I, I don't like to just get on the talk back and be like, okay, now sing this. Okay. Now sing this, you know, I always want to, um, uh, you know, what do you, I think, I think it'd be awesome in this part of the chorus if it, if it had a harmony or something, you know, let's try some harmony stuff there. Oh yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Let's try that. Um, and then I'm always recording several passes like, oh, the ending, man, you know, what you did there at the end of that was perfect. Like what, what else can you figure out for the beginning? You know, and in my mind all along, I, I, I know exactly what I would sing, you know, <laughs> but I want, I want them to find it. And, um, 
in part because it's 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 them and it's their record and it's it's their expression and also they come up with stuff that isn't the thing that i have in my mind yeah. that can be incredible and i uh, would never have um heard that if if it was just sort of a uh, here do this <laughs> um so it's really fun working with singers and I, i'll say the same thing really applies to working with any musician um searching for the gold and you know the the gold is always um is coming from them and and if you're doing your job right and creating a a space both physical and emotional for for them to feel free to um try a lot of different things and and feel okay about uh missing things or messing up then then it really becomes uh, a job of sort of keeping track of and harvesting the the best of those little nuggets that um, that they've delivered, you know? Yeah. And I, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, no, it's great. I find, I'm sure you've been in this, this situation, uh, you know, you may be in a session with no producer, might be a vocalist, you know, singing, working on a top line or just, you know, replacing something, cutting, cutting just a vocal. Sometimes the engineer becomes like a de facto vocal producer because there's maybe only you and the singer in the room. And then you start, yeah. you get put in that situation where the singer's like, was that good? And you were like, well, shit, I was looking at the compressor. I wasn't really paying attention. <laughs> and, and uh, <laughs> you know, and then you, you remember, you're like, oh, I need to, you know, maybe help this person through, but I can't sing. And, yeah. and I think the fact that you can sing every vocal producer that I've seen or engineer, really anybody that can sing who can jump in and kind of help somebody, I think brings so much value in today's world because I don't know, not, you know, not everybody can sing. It's like the most difficult instrument to, to control. Right. So, uh, I think that's, so I don't know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ex exactly. Did you ever find yourself kind of stepping into that de facto role of like, well, let's do one more take, maybe a little bit like this or like giving any breath support, you know, totally. suggestions all or, the time. Cause those are the things that I think the, a singer brings to the table is they can talk singer to the singer. You know what I mean? I, th I think that that part of it has really helped me um, throughout my whole time doing this um, really get calls back or become more um, helpful or, or valuable to whether it's to the artist directly or to the producer or, you know, certainly when starting out to uh, other engineers as uh, even an editor who's, um, I did years and years of work um, editing before I was ever talking directly to the artist or anything like that because of that musical background and how it informs the choices, um, picking the, the putting together comps of vocals or drum performances or full, you know, rhythm section performances and understanding and there's never one right answer to any of this stuff, but right. you being comfortable using your own intuition and your own muse and, and fandom and enjoyment of the music that's being recorded to lead you to certain decisions and uh, being confident to present them as best they can be to whoever's next, uh, in the, in the chain, whether it's a engineer or producer or, artist. And I think that being, uh, having a musical background has really, really helped with that. And as far as like offering guidance for breath and phrasing and notes and harmonies, like absolutely all that stuff. I'll definitely, um, like I say, I always have like the, the melody or harmony or, or something in mind that I think will work just in my back pocket if, if needed. The other stuff, the more technical stuff, um, I'm much more ready to, to share because it doesn't, uh, impose any type of musical, you know, melodic information to, to say for sure, I do this all the time, you know, like, you know, on the last couple of takes, you've got your breath, uh, right before the punchline of the chorus. And it, it I've heard you do it previously where you made it in one breath and it's, it's so much more, uh, impactful that way. So, you know, so, and, th and those are things that I always love to do as well in honor of the artist and their process is to play them back or reference things that they've already done that are awesome. Yes. And to let them be their own 
guide toward what's working. So um, yeah, those types of things I'll jump right in about, you know, oh, the phrasing you did on that that first pass was just killer. Let me play it back for you real quick. And then we're going to do a couple more. Just try to try to do that with, uh, you know, the same energy. Now you're singing it louder and more vibrant, you know, so bring the energy that you have now on take 12, but use this awesome phrasing you did instinctually the very first time we did it, which was perfect, you know? So yeah. then they're, they're kind of learning from themselves and I'm just kind of keeping track of everything and, um, and, uh, referencing stuff that's already worked really well. Yeah. That's, it's funny listening to you say that I think of, you know, how many times I've done similar things, but any, anybody listening should go back and just pay attention to the way that Dana phrased all of that, because what I heard was you were giving somebody notes without it sounding like notes. And I think that's super important when you're trying to figure mm -hmm. out your role in a room, like playing an example is, is a, such a good move. And I've seen people mm -hmm. do that because even though you could sing that phrasing to them, that's like a little bit more of an aggressive approach. It is, you know, yeah. and you're like, there's something about this pre-chorus that's cool. You know what it is and mm -hmm. they just need to hear it. So you don't have to mm -hmm. lay it out there like that. So, you know, yeah. everybody should take note of, of the, <laughs> the politics behind the words that you chose when you're describing that, which is great. Yeah. I like the idea of musical editing that you just kind of touched on mm. because I've done a lot of editing. You've worked on a lot of records that are very organic where I would imagine the players are probably very sensitive to choices that are made mm -hmm. if there are any. I've worked in situations on a TV show where they'll go from a pop track to, you know, a country song. And the goal is to, you know, just tighten everything a little bit. We're not making it perfect. Right. Do you have advice for people on how to find that like kind of musical line? Like, I think when people these days think of editing, they're thinking of hitting the quantize button, mm -hmm. hitting the hitting the automatic tune button in Melodyne. Yeah. throwing auto-tune on. But I think there's a lot more to making musical choices. What do, what do you think? Do you have anything yeah, to say about uh, that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think a couple of uh, um, variables will influence the, you know, the way, it will influence a decision to do something quick and automated like that. One of them is, is there an, an insane deadline? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the uh, I do a lot of mixing and producing for ads and uh, things like that. Those turnaround times are so fast and there isn't always time to do a finely crafted, you know, vocal comp and, and edit and all that stuff, which is why when I'm there to record those types of things, I'm, I'm often doing, making those decisions on the fly very quickly, um, playlisting everything, but always pulling stuff down my top picks onto new tracks. And, and, you know, th that's a whole other method of, of working really quickly. So there are times when, uh, the other variable I was going to say, if you're under deadline, super crunch mode, that's one. And the other is, genre specific. So certain genres definitely, um, lend themselves more to a quantized, uh, be it rhythmically or harmonically quantized, you know, <laughs> type of thing. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes I feel like it's, uh, uh, sloppy or should have give, been given more care. And other times it's, it's exactly what the doctor ordered, you know? <laughs> yeah. But that's never my go, my, never my go-to, even if it's a a super pop track. I'm always trying to preserve as much as possible of everyone's feel, even if it's going to be a disco beat, you know, um, and, and it's very same type of thing going the whole time. Uh, and maybe it's uh, James Gadson or something playing this, the, this beat and the sounds are awesome. Yeah. And, and it's a, it's going to be a, a pop track full of like, you know, synths and, and whatever the case may be, you know, for a modern, you know, sound with James Gadsden playing the drums or something like that. Right. To just throw him on a grid in service of a, a loopable sounding thing, you could definitely do that. But man, like if you've ever had the chance to solo and then unsolo <laughs> his, you know, groove, it's remarkable, you know, um, I'll never forget like quick side note before I get back to that, you know, um, the first time I ever worked with him was on, uh, uh, was it Justin Timberlake 
It was at uh, Neil Diamond's studio, and I'm trying to remember if it was with Neil or or Justin. But he played. He was playing a groove, and we soloed the drums. And I was the editor. I don't, I don't remember what I was doing. <laughs> Assistant engineer, editing. I knew I was going to be editing this stuff anyway, you know. And I thought to myself, like, oh my gosh, what a what a mess these drums. Um, it's going to take a lot of work. And, you know, I'm young and this is a three second analysis of someone soloing on the board. And right. I'm like, oh man. And then you unsolo it and it's like, don't touch a freaking thing. It is so grooving, you know? Yes. And he's playing to the band and we've just soloed him isolated. But man, when you put it all together, it's so good. So all that to say, um, these are world-class musicians, as you said, very, um, they're laying down incredible stuff. They're vibing with other players in the room. Yeah. What I'm trying to do is with the end result always in mind. Uh, and that's something that is always going on with, with me and I'm sure with you and others, it's like, that's the guiding force is like, um, uh, and I talk about this in the, um, vocal production course, you know, it's like, we have nothing else than our, than our, muse and our creative ideas of what this thing is supposed to sound like, you know, how to, what, which of these takes sounds like a record, you know, as, as you would expect it to sound, you know? So I'm really trying to, uh, throughout the full editing process when I have the time and I'm not like, you know, we need this in 30 minutes, you know, or, or less. I love to first pick through the, the takes and Mm -hmm. find the takes that are inherently the grooviest or, um, uh, or whatever, uh, adjective you could pick that would <laughs> be perfect for the, the type of music you're working on and then move as little as possible all by ear. Like yeah. I, I don't ever do beat detective and, and stuff like that. And that's not to shame on anyone who does or that tool. I do use that tool, uh, all the time, you know, to, when I'm, when I'm in crunch mode or when the drummer isn't a drummer, it's actually the guitar player who mm-hmm. needed to lay, we just needed a drum texture, you know, for, <laughs> for some, you know, 30 second, uh, M&M's cue or something like that, you, you know, basically just needed uh, a snare overhead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We call that waveform donation. Um, <laughs> and then we're going to, you know, <laughs> the rest of it is just going to uh, be a, an editing task. So, but when it's, uh, you know, incredible players and you, have the time and luxury to give it your all as I'm very lucky to, to be able to do, um, a lot of the time it's, yeah, I want, I want every, every awesome record sounding moment to be not ironed out, you know, to be like preserved all the while, you know, if the, if the drummer and the bassist hit a note off or, or it kind of, speeds up the pocket is still there but it's a little ahead of where the singer put it and then the bass player and so I'm moving section by section and and just trying to do as little the little tuck tuck-ins and touch-ups to keep what they do magical you know it's, okay somewhere some somebody's thinking this and and I kind of inherently have an answer to it but I'm gonna ask I'm gonna ask you you said in there pick every groovy you know moment or every hit record moment, a lot of that's going to come down to, I would imagine, in your opinion, taste. Like, Mm -hmm. what makes something a hit record moment for you? You get a feeling, you just like, that's the the best take, or you like the kind of the dirtier take that's like, what... Identify Mm -hmm. for somebody that has never sat in that chair what makes something a record moment. Hard, hard, (laughs) hard question. It is, and I think the answer is different for absolutely everybody, but I think that foundationally it just comes from being a listener and a fan knowing the records that you love and um knowing the way they make you feel and identifying that feeling um in new recorded material that you've never heard before by way of working on something that just got recorded you know yeah i think that that is always the guiding light And if the goal isn't to make a hit record, as it often isn't, you know, the goal might be to make uh, the most, you know, thrashed, non-top 40, angry, angular, artistic thing you can. 
And within those parameters, you can also, if you're a fan of that style of music and know that type of stuff, there's probably records that were formidable in your own upbringing and life or current life that you think really move you. And, and those become sort of the, the, the template or the blueprint within your mind's ear as a producer to know which takes move you in that same way, you know? So just to separate it from always, you know, everything needing to be a, a hit, there's lots of music that I love working on that will never be a hit, but it is a hit. And, and that's why I say sounds like a, you know, like a record because it, it kind of removes it from any sort of, um, commercial status. It's, um, more a, uh, a feeling you've, you've succeeded in sounding like something I want to listen to. Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> that excites me right from the first note, you know, it's kind of like why, um, I might go harder, work harder, longer with an artist on the opening or closing line of uh, a song or the intro or the outro. Like those are real defining stage setting moments Mm -hmm. that when they come on, on those records that you remember in your mind that really move you, man, you know, from the second, it's not like those records that, that shape your musical identity. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just got to wait till the, the second chorus. That's when the magic happens. It's like, no, like, those favorites in our minds that I have chills, just think I'm not even thinking about a specific record, but like <laughs> note one, it's, it's on, oh my gosh, you know, like this is a, a thing. This is a vibe. It's a moment. It's like, it's a record, you know? So just trying to find those moments as they're going down and taking note of them and uh, remembering where to find them to put together. <laughs> yeah. So I, I totally yeah. agree. There is, oh man, it's, it's, I'm trying to think of one, but like there are so many songs that you know from that first kick drum, or even though it's just totally. like just a kick drum, same kick drum that's been on like 50 records, but that yeah, that one kick drum, uh, totally yeah. Shout out to the Ember Mug, by the way, right? Mm, oh, mm. dude, Ember Mug, good eye, yeah. man. Uh, for anybody that's Life-changing. just listening, we're talking about <laughs> a heat uh, temperature controlled coffee mug. I mean, it's. It's goddamn yeah. magical. <laughs> it is. It is. It's probably the, um, the fa- I've tried a lot of different, like, you know, heated mugs or, or hot plates for tea or coffee or whatever. And, and, uh, my amazing wife, Carissa bought this for me, I don't know, a year or two ago yeah. for, you know, Christmas or birthday or something. And, uh, I thought like, well, how much was this thing? Like, and, and it's kind of expensive, you know? And I was like, this is this is very sweet. Thank you. But this has got to be silly. Like we can't, you know, and then I tried it and I was like, uh, I need lots of these. I Game need extra changing. warming plates. So like, I've got, I got, like I got a my little... charger right here. <laughs> yes. And, and then I've got, like, I have a charger that's always next to my bed. So when it's like wind down TV time, I just move the mug into there. You know, it, it's freaking awesome. Well, I think, you know, you've worked at studios for uh, it sounds like maybe a few years longer than me. There is nothing that sucks as bad as like you take a five minute break, you go into the lounge, like you get some coffee that the runner just made. It's like hot, and you're yeah. like, "This is amazing!" And the singer's like, "I gotta, I gotta sing right now." And you put it down, and then you come back like two hours later, and you're just like, "Oh, I'm just gonna throw it out now. I'll just start over." Yeah. But it's just the fact that my coffee's hot for like, I don't know, like Always. an hour and a half. Like I, it, you can just kind of just sit there. This is, this has nothing to do with music, but it's a super important thing to remember. It people. is. <laughs> yeah, I, I would argue it has everything to do with music. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that's... totally. I, I used to be, uh, you know, um, I drink coffee all day. Um, and, uh, I, I always have my like, you know, Yetis and stuff like that to, uh, you know, when I'm on, on the go. Yeah. Um, and then I pour that into often, if I know I'm going to be at a studio for a long time, several days or weeks, I bring the, the Ember set up with me. I travel with it, <laughs> you know, it's, my wife and I do that too. We go to go on vacation. We take our Ember. <laughs> totally. I'll bring, uh, you know, um, I was just talking about this with, a uh, an awesome member in mix protege who also is super coffee, uh, coffeeaholic and uh 
we were talking about, you know, well, what, what's your favorite place in Nashville for coffee? And, and, uh, he had just moved there. And I was like, honestly, I don't know because whenever I go work in Nashville or anywhere, I pack my, my Ember, I pack freshly ground beans of my choosing. <laughs> I've, I've got a mini like kettle, hot water kettle. Oh, I've yeah. got a little pour over set up and, uh, like, uh, just cause like, co- I love waking up to good coffee. And if there isn't coffee available, that's good. It'll, it'll, you know, I just have less of a pep in my step and, you know, it's like, I'm going to the studio to work all day. I need that pep, you know? That's right. That's right. Co- I mean, yeah. Coffee in, in the studio is definitely, it's a thing. And there's so many engineers that, I mean, we're already like easily distracted by like details, like, you know, tweak this, tweak yeah. that, tweak that. And then you're like, hey, do you want to roast your own beans? You want to get this expensive grinder? <laughs> you need an espresso machine? <laughs> it's just like totally. straight down the rabbit hole. Straight into the <laughs> rabbit hole. Absolutely. And, you know, like, uh, especially as, you know, engineers or people who are like, you know, gear obsessed anyway as well. Yeah. Uh, add that obsession to it. And it's like, now, of course, there's all kinds of coffee gear you can, you know, you can have. That's uh, totally true. That's awesome. totally true. Well, I had a question that was going to follow up with whatever we were talking about, but that's obviously gone now. Um, so let's do a hard change. I want to talk vocal tuning a little bit. I yeah. know that you're a big Melodyne user. Mm-hmm. I have, uh, hopefully you're not, you know, like uh, sponsored by Celebrity anyway. Know. But uh, nope. Melodyne ARA and Pro Tools, ha. fucking amazing. <laughs> but do you think it sounds different? I feel like it sounds different. Interesting. I feel like you it's know, a little I, bit more processed, but huh. the you know the way that it's been incor- like just being able to do that has been a lifesaver. But I don't like to do leads in it. I just feel a little sketched out. Am I crazy? What do you think? I I don't know, and I I love this question because I I recently had a text exchange with someone else who was asking about sound quality in you know this I. I that whole side thing, I, I kind of was like, I've never heard what you're hearing and you're in a different DAW. I don't know what the scene is over there. Yeah. But from from my experience, the ARA came out and I'm like, about time. I cannot wait. Yeah. And I got, I jumped right into it and I loved it. I love not having to render. I loved being able to, you know, trim or do some clip gain on a piece of audio that's in Melodyne, but, you know, having like, once it's in, gosh, I don't know why my camera keeps going in and out of focus, but once it's in Melodyne, you're kind of stuck. You can't do any more editing when you're using the plugin. So as you know, to have that ARA support is game changing to be able to just freely roam about the the clips and the Melodyne and everything. It's great. But man, I got burned twice uh, where hours and hours and hours of work just up and vanished where you open the session the next day and it's like, nah, we can't find the transfers of this stuff. And, you know, at first I was like, well, it's maybe my first time. And it wasn't that much time that I lost. And I was like, that's weird. And then it happened again. Like on, I had just, I'd spent so much time editing these very tricky vocals and it, I lost it all. And I was like, this is crazy. Yeah. Um, I cannot, I will not use this until they get this sorted out. And I maybe, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sponsored by, <laughs> by anyone. I, I feel bad, you know, putting that out there, but they do, I don't know if it's Avid or, or Celimony or whatever, but not, not ready for me, like not ready for prime time. Uh, so I've, I've moved back to my, my regular way of the, the plugin. I have, um, Melodyne Pro or Studio. Yeah, right. Love being able to just, it's expensive. And I tell people that to, who are just getting into it, you know, you definitely want assistant at least. Yeah. Is that the, you need all the tools, you yeah. know, like spring for at least the assistant. And the, here's the reason why, even though it's, it is very expensive, but it's, it's what I do. So I, I do the studio and I love that you can, um, I never, I never use the standalone, but the the ability to see all your Melodyne tracks in one interface and um, that's that was a huge change in. when they did that. It's it's great. Yeah. And there's one other thing in there in the studio. I can't think of what it is, but that really um, sets it is a, is a really nice benefit to have. 
it escapes me at the moment, but, um, yeah, I totally, I totally love it. And I, I'm not sure where the hang up on the ARA portion is. I really, really want to use that. And, uh, I just, I just can't yet. So all that to say, I, I didn't, in the short time I used it, I didn't notice really any sound differences. Yeah. I wasn't looking for any, but, uh, I, I hope I hope one day soon, uh, under a new release or something so <laughs> with issue. promised stability, I'll I'll be able to weigh in on that. That's interesting. I luckily, Naga Wood, I have not had that problem, but I do know okay, uh, yeah. one other person that lost what they were working on, and I feel yeah. like I don't know. You you know how you can convince yourself so easily, like you can mispatch a compressor and then just like turn the knob and be like, you know, a tiny bit, and you're like, mm, yeah, that sounds great, and the assistant's like, yeah, that's not on. But um, <laughs> <laughs> for I mean, sure, everybody's yeah. done it. But to me, it Absolutely. feels like it gets a little bit like, uh, you know, whatever the the flatten tool is. Yeah, there's like the D vibrato, and then the one that like evens it. Like, oh, that one yeah. seems mm -hmm. more aggressive. Like I like I do things with that that I used to do, and now when I do it, that's when I start to hear like, like when you have a long sustained note, I start to hear a process there. But Oh, um, yeah. Anyway, I, I've gotten in the habit of just like fixing, like, you know, you're listening to BVs while you're mixing and there's like, obviously one side is flat. It's just so nice to be able to select that word, I know. load it into Melodyne, push I it up know. like, a, you know, just as far as it needs to go and then commit it. And that might be the reason that I haven't run into the problem that you're having is I'm very quickly you're committing, committing it yeah. Yeah, and just moving on with my life. So. I think that I got uh, lured into the romantic notion that I wouldn't have to commit until... The end. Maybe mix time or something yeah. like that. But I, I will say, like, you know, I'm I use Melodyne constantly and I'm very uh attuned to what the processing sounds like when it is when it does become audible. I'm also very in tune to what it sounds like on films and TV shows, and I'd bang my head against the wall, especially on those that are giant budget going like who melodyned this? It's like you can hear it so clearly. But you know, um, you know, you've done. I, at least I've been in the situation where somebody on like an overdub VO stage records some famous person singing a cappella, and then they yeah. send it to the composer, and the composer's like, "You want me to do what with this?" Yeah, like no, and I do that. Like I've recorded so many superstar. Uh, you know, actors and athletes and stuff like that. And you can do it, you know, yeah. it, you can work magic. You can make pretty much anyone. Of course, I'm usually there producing them as well to, to help get at least the, you know, it's not like a self record or something right, exactly. like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, it can be done. And so I always feel like it's sort of, uh, sometimes I hear what I think is the equivalent of the, you know, auto mode set to stun, you know, or something like yeah, that. Yeah. I guess I'm always, I'm in it all the time and I know what it sounds like when it's, when it's audible. And so I'm constantly vigilant about not being audible. Yeah. Um, and one of, and I love that, uh, I can't remember what it's called either, but the one that takes the average, use that constantly, but I do chop things mm. a lot. And, you know, I think I touch on this in the vocal production course as well, where I am definitely when, it, when a long note or even a short note, you know, has a, a big movement. I call, I call it, this is because he probably wouldn't even remember this, but when, uh, Andrew Sheps was, showing me Melodyne for the first time. Um, this was on a System of a Down album, a double album. Uh, he, uh, he, he, <laughs> he, see, there was some long note, you know, and he's like, oh, see this one, it's got all this, all the warbles. You can see the crazy vibrato. It's, it's like, it's got a little too much mustard on it. You know, like the, <laughs> so I always think of it as, uh, you know, when I'm, when I'm fixing the mustard on, on something that's really got a lot, Rather than flatten it all out yeah. or take the average, I, I'm i definitely not going to cut every mustard vibrato. But when you get those crazy shapes or the general vibe is like it's it started sharp and then it went flat, I'm definitely going to chop that and and move them, maintain the, the, the mustard shape, but bring it kind of globally in line. And then I love using the um, note transition tool mm, to... Yeah smooth out those bumps. Um, that's always my first go-to 
to, to try to, I guess it, it kind of falls in line with what we we're talking about with drum editing. You know, it's like, I want to keep the, the, as much as I can that the artist sang, mm. you know, and some of those, and, and you can see it, you know, it's one of the wild things about working in graphic editors like that. Like you can see somebody's vocal idiosyncrasies like, oh, I, it's interesting. I never would have noticed it, but, but they always attack from above the note, you know, or, or they always have this deep swoop on certain, you know, things or, you know, just the stuff that is who, who we are. We all, we all do these things. It's just it's bizarre or surreal to see it, but th that's what makes them them, you know, yeah. and I'm, I'm not there to flatten all that stuff out, you know, but if they do their, their thing and overall it's up here, I'm just going to try to keep that shape, but, but bring it here. And, and if there's an issue, I'm just going to, chop the part that's the issue you know like my thing that I'm I never want to do is just I, ne I never want to have it sound perfect because mm -hmm. it's it's not and and there will even be cases when I've, I've corrected some issues to the left and the right and now this note that I haven't even corrected sounds like it's been corrected, even though it hasn't, they just nailed that note, you know, like I might even like mess with that note a bit just because I need these to be perfect. This one's insignificant, but it, for some reason is sounding tuned, you know, like, oh yeah, yeah. I just, I never want it to feel worked on. Um, and, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I mentioned in the, um, in that vocal production course about ways to, to force yourself to be a listener and not, not be looking at the screen and mm -hmm. to constantly be checking your work, you know, away from the sweet spot and with, with a, you know, lyric sheet to keep track of things that you hear that are odd. And sometimes the things that I hear that are odd haven't even been worked on or, <laughs> you know, there's little surprises, you know, where it's like, Oh, I didn't, it's not for me. I didn't even, put that into Melodyne, you know, yeah. and it sounds tuned, you know, or whatever. And then, then you're like, well, it caught my ear. So what are we going to do about it? Let's go looking through the raw takes and see if there's a better piece to put into that comp right there. You yeah. Know? Uh, I was going to say it, uh, just two quick Melodyne tips. One, I've found tuning really quiet. It makes it really, mm -hmm. a, really apparent that something is yeah. out. That's, that's good. And, yeah. and I like to do, I like to do a pass with the music, tune it with the, you know, with the music. But then do a solo pass where you just listen down. And I find that anytime you miss, you know, maybe you've gone to a chromatic, anytime you've put something in the wrong note, it's very, very clear when you're in solo that you've gone out of scale. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. in the music, like, you don't catch it in the music for some reason. And, mm -hmm. But it's that solo moment where you're like, whoa, okay, that's a half step out. My bad. Sorry, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah. For sure. I mean, to add on to that, I would say, I never tune in headphones. There's, mm. there's some kind of weird acoustic, uh, you know, weirdness <laughs> Yeah, that you ever, you ever be like working in headphones for a while and then you, you take them off and it sounds like the song's in a different key. Like, yeah, it, there's just weird stuff that pitch wise, I'm not saying music can't be enjoyed in headphones. I love listening in headphones, but when it comes to pitch, I don't, I don't really... Um, I don't really trust it. I'll do it in a hotel room or something if I have to, you know, but yeah, it's definitely less than, less than ideal. I agree with that. I agree. Yeah. Since you said headphones, I know you've, you know, you've recorded a lot of bands, you've recorded a lot of singers, something that I haven't somehow not really talked about on this show is how important a headphone mix is. I mean, especially for oh, singers, gosh. right? What, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on just like, how do you approach a band session versus a singer? Do you give singer con singers control or do you give them what you want so you can kind of help them out? Like what, what's your headphone mixer philosophy when it comes to just making music? Uh, headphone mixes are everything. Everything. I, I would rather the headphones sound more amazing. Like if I had to pick a more amazing sound, like I'd rather the headphone mix be killing uh, while I, while I work out the in control room yeah. mix for myself later, you know, if it's a full band and, um, we have the luxury of mixer systems, you know, like a private queue or, um, some of the other, uh, Furman or here, here back, or, yeah. or, or some of those things that can be 
that can be great. Uh, it definitely takes a load off the engineer um, to an extent. Yeah, right. It can also be very overwhelming for certain artists. Um, so when when using a system like that, uh, I'm always uh, and with the you know how staff or assistants um, are on this as well, constantly throughout the day or first thing in the day, making sure that that those are set nicely. And I talk to the artists and every one of the, um, uh, every one of the musicians as well, band members or studio players or whatever, before, you know, giving them the headphones, you know, just a quick conversation. You, you know, these things, have you used this thing before? You know, yeah. I'm sure you have, you know, but here's kind of, I like to set, you know, set the master like around noon or two o'clock, you know, it, it will go super loud, you know? So like, here's kind of how I do it. Cause that way then you've got a little headroom to, you know, some play to give yourself some more overall volume and then just kind of, and I'll, I'll do it too. I love the private cues and, and they all have this, I think where I can, I can have my own headphones as I'm showing them this and I'm building the mix for us, you know? And so I always kind of give them a starter, make sure they understand where everything is. Everything is labeled really clear. And then Unless there's an issue, I won't really, I won't mess with their settings because yeah. they're going to make themselves at home and get something that works for them. Um, and until I hear that, you know, hey, I can't, I'm all the way up. I'm blah, blah, blah. And I can't get more, you know? Oh, yeah. Let's run out there. Oh, I see what happened. You know, you turned your master fader down and everything's cranked. So I'm going to turn all these down and I'll just walk them through it again right there with my headphones. There might be a million things going on. I'm doing this really fast. Like, I got you. I got you. Here's what happened. We'll bring this back. I'm going to bring this up. Is this cool? You like, you like, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not doing it blind or, or deaf as, as the case may be, you know, like I'm doing it with listening and quickly putting it together. Something that I think sounds good. So, you know, those systems are great once people know how to set themselves up. Yeah. And uh, so the caveat being like, I always pre-mix all those boxes to uh, a way, and I'll sit at every location and listen and set up a mix that I think they'll dig. So when they put the headphones on, their ideal response is like, oh, here, let me show you this mixer. And like, oh, I mean, it sounds sounds great. You know, like, I'm good, let's go. You know, that's that's like the goal, you know? Yep, yep. And if that works out, then it's really, of course, it becomes really handy because it takes some uh, work off of um, me as an engineer to chase every player's individual requests. And if there's a lot of players, that can be a lot of requests. Yeah. So the other side of that, which is probably much more applicable to the majority of listeners and home recording people and even, even a lot of studios, is just like, I'm in tons of situations, my studio included, where you get what I'm hearing, you know? Yeah. And there's a great simplicity to that. And there's a great benefit to that as well. Um, because it's gonna, it, you're hearing what I'm hearing. So I'm always um, tinkering with things and trying to make it as, as good as possible. Unlike the the boxes, it's much less of a set it, forget it. Mm -hmm. Now, the flip side of that, of course, is any changes that I want to make, even on input, you know, like they're going to hear those things. Um, and so I make all of those changes during a recording pass. Like I try not to do it during a recording pass, but if I have to, you know, very, very subtle moves. Yeah, that's a good point. Good you know, point. and very subtle moves always during recording on the input side. You know, if somebody, if I'm kind of peaking on a, getting a lot, too many overs on, you know, let's say, uh, the, the, wow, the singer's really singing a lot louder than that first pass, you know, and we're in a recorded take, I'm going to find a, you know, a fully, either a fully variable fader on the output of the mic pre or, or something like that. Or if there's only detented options, I'll pick a spot where they're taking a breath and I've heard this part before and I'll click it down real fast in a moment that won't ruin the recording. But even if you're not recording and, and they're just, and you're making changes to what they're listening to, the rhythm section track that's pre recorded and we're in overdub land. It's very easy for me to, um, yes, I've got an ear on what they're singing and everything, uh, but like, you know, the bass should be louder. And like, uh, 
oh, I forgot the percussion's muted. You know, like yeah. don't do any of that stuff or certainly don't turn on percussion when they're in the middle of, uh, you know, uh, a pass. I might turn up the bass, but I'll do it on the playback, you know, fader very gently, you know, so I'm, I'm always trying to be very aware of <laughs> what's going on. Yeah. They're hearing, they're hearing what I'm hearing. So, and the, only, you know, the bummer, one of the bummers with, with that limited setup, um, of which there, there are relatively few, there's, um, great case to be made for just like, yeah, keep it simple. One of the downsides with that, of course, is like, if someone needs click and there's only one, you know, the, the headphone, the headphones are a mirror of the, the mix bus. Like yeah. that means like, I'm going to be listening to a bunch of click too, which is, um, not ideal, you know, much rather be like, yo, you got the click knob on your, it's channel seven, you, you know, turn it up. Everybody else can turn it down, you know, whatever. Yeah. I'm not listening to it. Um, I will always keep it. If I'm on a, a console, I'll keep that click in the mix enough so that when everybody stops playing and I'm still recording just to catch any extra magic, I, oh, the click's on, you know, let me turn that off, you know? Yeah. So it's just not like blasting. I like to be in record in between takes because some incredible stuff can happen. And if that click's going, A, it's going to be super obnoxious and B, they'll know a recording is happening. <laughs> and I, I want them to not be self-conscious about that stuff. So that's a, that's a pretty awesome trick right there. I wanted to go back and just tell everybody how important it is not to turn that like Neve knob in the singer's long note. You know, like if something, <laughs> yeah. if something is like a little over compressed or like on the edge of distortion yeah, and you're like, oh, I have to turn this down. Just wait until the gap. Like Dana said, you're going to get yeah. a breath. If you're going to screw something up, screw the breath up, flip that knob because right. that might be the best long the note that they do. And it's easier to, okay. A, most listeners are not going to hear that it's over compressed or distorted and you can kind of fix the distortion to a certain extent these days. So like, don't, you know, yeah. there's plenty of records that have mistakes in the best part. So don't, don't, totally. don't put a mistake in there, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's perfectly said. You know? Yeah. Very, very well uh, said. But yeah. I, I wanted to, to follow up with you talking about staying in record. I would, this feels like something that maybe comes from your time with Rick. This sounds like something that he would be into to always be recording because you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, For sure. What's the philosophy behind that? How often do you do it? And what if you're doing playlists? Do you flip real quick, go back and record? Like you just let it run? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. When, it, yeah, the always, always be recording for sure uh, is, is very much uh, learned from Rick and with, with safe, with safeguards too, you know, where, there's two parts to this. On one hand, in those sessions and in any studio uh, that I'm working that has uh, another another system, like we we call it the Dat Rig at you know at Shangri La. Um, just hearkening back to the olden days of of Dats, always getting a running two track mix of what's coming off the console. Yeah. Um, these days we do that obviously with just a side you know, a little Apollo setup or something like that. And, um, that's a really handy thing that I've, uh, gotten in the habit over the years as well, anywhere to always have this separate rig recording everything. Um, just a stereo mix, you know, uh, usually it's a stereo mix off the, the console or, you know, if we're talking in the box type of thing, it could just be a malted output from one and two of the DAW or something, but it's going to a separate DAW um, that is recording all day long. And it would usually be, um, the console, um, uh, mix bus output yeah. plus a send from the, whatever studio talkback is going on. You and that can get a little talkbacks on and off between takes, I'm assuming. Uh, well, I, yes. And uh, yes and no, there's a couple <laughs> different ways to do it, but whatever it is, uh, or at least my talkback, if not everyone else's and it's usually everyone else's because we're usually tying all those things together yeah talk back mics out in the room um which will either be on one of their mixer knobs for them to control or oftentimes i have it on a fader on the console where i can bring it up for them in between takes um so that they are always hearing my talk back and you know rick's talk back if it were working 
And then they can hear their band talk back only when I bring the fader up in between takes so that during takes, they're not hearing a room full of super compressed talkback mics. And then whatever that system is built on, usually, uh, you know, an AUGS send on the console, we can malt that send and send that to a third channel on the DAT rig. Right. So that um, separate from the the gold nuggets of, you know, what's coming through the console, we'll have um, the, uh, um, the talkback as well. So that always, you know, I'm always recording in Pro Tools multi-track. Um, the moment the artist arrives, I, I hit record. I've already tested all the tracks. I've already done a half hour of recording while we're doing, you know, final setup um, just to make sure the discs are, are taking it and we're not going to have any hiccups or surprises. When the artist arrives, even if I, I hear them down the hall, we go into record and um, let's say, and of course the DAT rig is always, is always recording. So if I'm not in record, we can still catch, you know, oftentimes it'll be somebody in the, in the control room in between, you know, we've, we've listened to playback of a take and now we're discussing uh, next moves or ideas and Pro Tools isn't running because we're not listening to anything and there aren't like live mics uh, for recording per se in the control room, but there are mics going to that DAT recorder. Mm. And so if anybody is like, oh, what if the chorus went da, 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 and, and then, oh, that's a great idea. And then a minute later, they're like, you know, what, what was that thing that you sang? You're like, uh, I don't remember, you know, like to the DAT rig, you know, like it's on there, you know, and now you've got this, you've captured that, that thing. So even if in the control room uh, a magic idea occurs and and isn't quickly remembered, there's a record of it. But what I was going to say is like you know I might hear the band enter uh, the studio down the hall or or something like that, or be told that they just arrived. Um, I'm going to throw it and record uh, just in case someone starts singing down that hallway or busts into the studio singing opera voice being funny and it's hysterical and like would make a hilarious outro to a, a song or whatever. The worst that can happen is I'll burn through 45 minutes of nothing and I've been listening the whole time and nothing happened. They haven't even entered the studio and they're just having a meeting out there. I just command period. And yeah. it's like it never happened. And then I immediately command spacebar and start recording again. So when I know that that not, I'm doing my due diligence, but nothing has happened, nobody's even in the studio at the moment, just command period, the dry, the disk space is back to where it was. And, uh, but you have to be very certain that you're, you know what you're doing with that command period, because there is no, no coming back from that, that. One. No, no, no. So that's awesome. Yeah. So always, always recording because you never know what, what's going to happen. Also too, if there's nothing going on and the band isn't even in the room, but I need to go to the bathroom, <laughs> I'm in record and I'll just, you know, make eyes with the assistant. Like, you know, I'm, I'm rolling, just step over if anything happens, you know, and then I come back and anything happened now they're still outside, you know, okay. Command period, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, that's amazing. Has, uh, to your recollection, has anything ever come off that DAT rig that got released or, or added to anything? Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, more often, um, well, two things. More often, I'm also catching it on the main Pro rig. Tools. Right. On the main rig. Uh, and in that sense, yeah, tons of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what the DAT rig is more often helpful for are just referencing an idea that was fleeting that just somebody just needs a refresher of yeah. or, and this happens so often too, where it's like, I, well, no, I remember what I sang, you know, or the, or speaking as if I were the, the artist or the band or something, um, or maybe it was any, even an idea that, that I threw out there or something, but, and I'll try to recreate it, but it's just not, there was something about the way it went down. And then you, you, you can go back and listen and it's like, oh yeah, I'm singing exactly what I sang, but I didn't realize that someone had a guitar in the room and they were playing a different chord. That's what made it so awesome. Yeah. Like, so the secret wasn't the singing, but it was something else going on 
in the room and they weren't even in the room with us. These mics were picking up somebody tinkering on the piano out there. So just like, just kind of like, it's like ghost hunting, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just got to be be ready, uh, ready. Better have that, that uh, EKG or whatever it's called yeah. rolling, <laughs> you know, to catch the the spooky stuff, that, you know? That's amazing. Well, uh, since we're kind of kind on the topic, I wanted to ask you a question about working with Rick. Is there one thing that you took away from working with him that you think you could really only take away from working with a producer like that in the room? You know, like he could tell people how he works and is there just, is there anything that, I mean, there must be a million things that stick with you, but is yeah, there a standout? There's a million. Um, I think, um, I mean, so, so, so many, many. <laughs> um, just, um, I'd say just the seeing, um, the way he works with, with people and runs the session, you know, including myself and my <laughs> services and everybody else on staff. And it's, it's all an extension of, of him and his style Yeah, and seeing him diffuse, you know, so many, um, worried artists or, um, seeing him encourage ideas, you know, being, uh, just watching that interaction has been just a incredible experience for um, all the all the many years that we've worked on stuff together. It's just always a treat, you know. When I um, when I see other people in sessions getting really angry, or um, yeah. it, it just it's not it's not part of his world, you know. Um, to to be. <laughs> to be volatile or yeah. or angry like that and and certainly art you know everybody's different and artists have bring their whole um situation to a, a recording and recording in general can be very nerve-wracking under the microscope or you know you want to do your best and all that he's just very um encouraging and relaxing and uh a, a great listener both to music and to the ideas and concerns of the artist. That's really, uh, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. It's been, it's been awesome to watch. Yeah. I, I mean, I can't imagine I've, I've, I've never met Rick yet alone work with him, but I think a lot of people today, you know, they think about production productions now, like it's a so much about the technicalities and making everything. And it's like, oh yeah, you, you're not really killing that guitar part. Let me, let me get that guitar. I'll play it for you. There's so much of that, that I think people forget that like, you know, making art is about people. And when you have like mm -hmm. producers like Rick or some of the classic producers, that old school mentality of like, I'm not going to play any music. I'm just going to guide these people where yeah. I think they should go. I think that's just like, I don't know, maybe it's because yeah. I'm getting older, but to me, that's just like, so like, I, I would love to get to that point, but like, you're talking about people that are on this other level of like emotional understanding and and so, yeah, yeah, I'm sure that was a, was a trip to get to work with him regularly. So that's, uh, that's great. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. It's, uh, he's amazing. I have nothing but love and total respect and, uh, and, and thankful to, um, uh, be taken along for so many rides like that. And I know exactly what you're saying, you know, the, the word producer or the meaning of it as it relates to music has really changed or maybe split into a mm. couple of different um, meanings. Yeah. And I, I think a lot about that stuff. Um, not just to be, um, philosophical about it, but really as it relates to work that I do and explaining roles, uh, to what, what I can bring wearing different hats to an artist project. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about like, maybe it's like, yeah, these two different forks, there's, um, songwriter producers, and there's record producers. Mm. And, uh, and I mean that in the literal, like, uh, copyright, uh, sense, right. not, not in any sort of hierarchical, um, I like that name better, you know, but I mean, literally like, you know, there are a lot of producers who I think, um, are songwriters, uh, and, and, and all of the above are working towards, uh, the record, the sound recording is, is what I mean by that. Yeah, you know? yeah. But there are certainly a lot of, um, producers who excel at the 
songwriting part Mm -hmm. and producer has become, I think through, um, especially sort of R and B hip hop beat making culture, the de facto name for someone who writes songs in that genre and, um, also puts, puts the sounds together in, in a sound recording. But I think that that's sometimes confusing about the more traditional record producer who is maybe not less of a songwriter or perhaps is, but doesn't, uh, isn't there for that role. Yeah. Someone who, who likes to work with songwriters to create the best sound recording, the best record possible for that moment, for that song, which for which there might be dozens of different records uh, serving that song. And um, my dream has always, even though I am a, a musician, I do a lot of writing and co-writing. My my real like main love is record producing, record making, yeah. working, w- being being uh, helpful in an overall guidance type of way for a project that uh, you know might have d- various writers and and songwriter producers involved. Yeah. yeah, but it's a it's a tricky one, you know. It, it, to your point, it, it's really the terminology changes and um, can be hard to understand or dissect or explain to others. And I'm not sure that my answer is the right answer. It's just kind of what I how I've been thinking about it yeah. lately. Yeah. Well, I think it all it really it depends a lot on the artist. You know, you think about you're maybe there's a great singer who doesn't really write; they're just looking for great songs. Yeah. Versus, you know, a band that's been together for 30 years that they have a thing and they're just like looking for a different flavor. There's yeah. two different types of producers that are going to take on those situations, you know, and that's just. Yeah, very true. You know, it's a different job. Those are two different jobs. Mm-hmm. Not to say one, there's not a person out there that can do both of them, but you're going to put yep. a different hat on to, yeah. to do those two. So. Yeah, well said. Yeah, for sure. Okay, before we go, we were just talking about like, you know the most human of human producers. Now let's talk about like the least human thing possible. Mm, good segue. Uh, yeah. <laughs> AI, <laughs> right? Um, so I was thinking about this. We chatted about it before we started. I don't really have a question here, but I feel like, you know, AI is coming to every industry. I think it's mm-hmm. going to be a little bit slower to come to music, but it's going to be here one day. And I think it's going to affect who works and who doesn't. What do you think is going to make a person whether they're an engineer, a mixer, a producer, still valuable as these AI tools come, you know? Yeah, it's a it's a total relevant, um, heavy question that everybody's thinking of in every single industry. I think that the you know the short answer to me, as someone who doesn't have the answers and is just as you know uh, apprehensive of it uh, and excited about AI, I love I love all this stuff. Um, is I think people. And uh, of course, I'm immediately reminded to myself of the, the my one of my favorite moments in the movie Office Space, where the one dude is like trying to preserve his job by explaining that I'm a I'm a people person. <laughs> I work with I'm good with people. You know, like sure you are, buddy. Yeah. Um, but I think that that um, is the uh, at least for recording and the capturing of ideas. Um, you know, we've already seen, uh, with, with no disrespect or slight whatsoever to the amazing, you know, mastering engineers that I love working with and can, and continue to, but there is a a field that, uh, uh, the companies are and have been for a while aggressively pursuing as a sort of automated thing with limited results. Uh, Again, I think much like our beat detective, uh, sort of uh, chat, it's, it's maybe kind of a similar thing. If you're in in a low budget time crunch, there's some pretty neat tools out there, but when you're working on, you know, your life's work and and your, your next album or your first album, and it can be, uh, there's a difference between that and just sort of work that, that we sometimes do for volume, volume sake. And I don't mean like, um, VU volume. I mean, like got to get all these cues out for a deadline that's, you know, and they need to be. Um, so I hope and and think that those relational connections, the teasing out w- in person of 
those ghosts we were talking about and creating a space for artists to feel open to record, creating a, a space that's free, hopefully, of technical difficulties where, where all the headphone mixes sound amazing. That's right. And, and you can really just plop down, hit record and, and experiment and talk about it and choose the, the most meaningful takes. And I say meaningful, trying to think of like, well, how would a computer choose the best takes, you know? And as we've already discussed, there is a difference between, you know, perfection and intonation and rhythm mm -hmm. and yeah. what moves you, um, uh, you know, emotionally you know, certainly some AI could, uh, and, and probably already has, uh, dissected the, you know, entire history of the billboard, you know, catalog to see what, what these things have in common or whatnot. But, um, I mean, I have to think that it's making records is a lot of fun, yeah. um, mm. for all its vulnerabilities and, uh, technical difficulties and long hours and whatever. But but it is fun and it's uh, it's it's an amazing way to connect with other people uh, just kind of by nature of what it is. And um, so I hope that those qualities will uh, give it some longevity. Uh, and all the while, you know, like I say, I'm I love technology and I'm excited in my own way about these um, all the cool AI stuff that that's happening. So I I try not to be too. Uh, you know, Salem witch trials about this stuff. <laughs> like, I, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. You know, it's, it's actually funny listening to you talk about it. I think what we were just talking about with that old school classic producer, people like Rick that are very in touch with the human aspect. I feel like that's the thing that you're never, you're never going to lose. And maybe AI will actually be a little bit freeing for like the producer engineer that wants to not have to focus so much on those technicals and can start to play that more human role. Um, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like maybe it'll actually allow everybody to be part of that emotional artistic mm -hmm. conversation and not have to worry about exactly what's going on with this or that. And yeah. we'll, we'll have our AI headphone mixer assistant, <laughs> yeah. you know, and get the, co very, the coffee runner. But Very cool uh, take on our prediction. That's really interesting. Yeah. In worst case, you and um, I can start an AI headphone mixer company. And we'll be good. There, I mean, so why not? stamp the TM right that's on right, there. That's right. <laughs> Ideas taken, people. It's taken. That's right. Uh, back off. Uh, also, dude, this has been a lot of fun. Let me hit you with the last questions because I know you're mixing like 10,000 projects. Um, yeah. And you got to get to work. And you've got a kid and I've got a kid. we got a lot of stuff going on. Oh, yeah. Um, so I don't know how much you've listened to the show, but the first question I, I like to close with is, was there a time in your career where you chose to redefine what success meant to you? Every day, man. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> it's, a true, it's a true answer. Um, yeah, you know, it's something that uh, is considered almost daily or reminded. Um, I um, I think, you know, uh, probably an answer you've heard a lot is just, uh, you know, being able to do any of this is a, a real gift, you know, to be able to work in the music industry in a in a town like LA where so much has happened and to kind of um, rub shoulders with awesome people, whether they're famous or just awesome because they're awesome is really remarkable. Um, when, let's see, did I, when I changed what it means, that's a great, it's a great question. Um, it's a thinker. <laughs> it is a thinker. Um, you know, there's, probably age and fatherhood and things like that, uh, redefine certain things or prioritize different things. Yeah. Um, COVID certainly changed and reprioritized different things. Um, I think for me, it's just always been, um, the, the surroundings are, are constantly changing. Uh, but I think that my, my, my idea of success has fairly remained unchanged and just that if I can just keep doing this thing, you know, yeah. uh, this thing that I, I get to do professionally for money is also this thing that I just can't get enough of anyway. Like I love it. I've just always been just enamored by 
music and the uh so that's that's always the 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 goal the su- the success goal is just to like just hang on a little longer <laughs> man <laughs> i mean it's you know it it feels good to get to you know work in your passion and have that be your job and you know we we're all yeah we all feel fortunate and lucky so yeah yeah um, for sure and the last question i've got for you before i let you get back to work what is your current biggest goal and what is the next smallest step you're going to take to go towards it? Oh man, I've been spending a lot of time uh thinking about that. I think that, you know, the aside from, you know, some fantastic projects that I'm in the midst of that I'm uh my next step being just uh working on the mixes and getting them out. I think the um the next, you know, biggest goal has been this platform, the mixed protege stuff, making courses, um, has been something that's been a goal for a while. Um, and is, is, has been happening and that's really, really neat. I've always loved teaching. Uh, that's always been a part of my, my life as, as a saxophone teacher, you know, yeah. in high school and, uh, certainly my first gigs out in, in LA, um, were uh, consulting, you know, studios changing from tape to Pro Tools, or um, you know, working with different clients. Uh, I love, I, I love getting. It's very easy. Uh, it comes natural for me getting other people fired up about what they can do in their studio. Yeah, you know, and I love seeing people, you know, that light turn on. And um, so, yeah, the uh, I think that my current, you know. A goal is to keep finding uh, wonderful people who are fired up about their own recording and producing and mixing journeys. And yeah, the next little steps um, toward that, that's kind of what I, I work on late at night. I'm a, I'm a night owl fan. I get the, I get my ladies to bed as, as I call it, uh, <laughs> my wife and my daughter. And, um, and then I spend, you know, countless hours, uh, um, working in the living room, just on the laptop, you know, yeah. figuring out what the next, um, to how to bring, how to bring value to the folks who are, um, in that mixed protege platform. Um, That's awesome. which this is probably one of the, you know, earlier mentions of it. It's something that I've been doing, um, for my assistants, um, for a while to train my mix uh, prep setup. Um, so that I'm not always doing that in person. And it's, I'm now like the vocal production class is in there now and I've got forums and I'm doing like live mixing, you know, or when cool. I'm working with an artist who's agreed to it. Um, uh, can I, can I live stream some of what I'm working on, on your project to my, uh, mix protege crew. So just really trying to keep them stoked and, uh, be, a, a helpful source for people who are trying to up their game. Cool, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, yeah. uh, before we go, let people know where they can find you if they want to work together, if they want to learn more about Mixed Protégé, whatever yeah. you got, you throw it out there. Cool. My website is DanaNielsen.com. Uh, last name is N-I-E-L-S-E-N. And uh, that's where people can, you know, uh, I've got a little form to uh, start a project inquiry if you want me to... Uh, kind of the do it for you services of producing, mixing, uh, engineering, um, et cetera. And then if you want to learn with me and hang out, uh, as part of the community, um, that's mixprotege.com and, uh, uh, love to, love to, uh, say hi, come say hi, <laughs> shoot me a message or, uh, sign up for free or send me your project inquiry on my, on my site. And, nice. um, I've got openings in tw- in 2044. <laughs> 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 no, I'm teasing. I, I'm, I'd love to hear from uh, anybody. And that's part of what's fun about, you know, honestly, lastly, that's part of the mixed protege thing. It's like I get a lot of incredible requests. I love working with independent artists. Uh, I, I love helping them release and do all that stuff. And I get a lot of requests on uh, Dana Nielsen.com. Uh, and there's so many times when I, I just don't have the bandwidth, but if you're doing it yourself, come hang out over here. I'm in there, you know, every day, 
um, checking in on, on forums and stuff like that, learning, learning together, uh, people upload their mixes and, uh, and I try to respond, you know, with, and as does the community, you know, like, Ooh, this is awesome. Try this or that. And, um, so it's, a, it's another way, well, it's not the do it for you service that I, um, can't do at the moment. It's at least a way to, to stay connected and share some ideas. And, um, it's a nice uh, alternative to offer people when, when times are busy. That's cool, man. That's awesome. Well, this has been aw- this has been a great hang. We'll we'll have to get some coffee or or something. Yes, with, with our embers. Yeah, we'll bring our embers somewhere oh, in I LA. Love it and make I them love fill it. Up. it. Let's do that. That would be perfect. And then and then we should film it and tag Ember. Done. <laughs> Ember, we are accepting sponsorships, mixed protege, protege right. and progressions. We're we're open. Uh, yes. And we need, you know, seed money for the AI, uh, AI headphone company. That's right. So. Oh, yeah. So any any VC <laughs> investors were open to that as well, as long as you also have an Ember. So that's right. Cool. Awesome, man. Synergy. This has been. <laughs> <laughs> that's it for this week's episode of Progressions. Thank you so much for watching or listening. Be sure to check out all the links and resources mentioned in the episode down below in the video description or in your podcast show notes. If you're listening to this as an audio podcast, please leave a review on Apple or Spotify. It helps the show so much. And if you're watching on YouTube, feel free to drop any thoughts or questions about the episode down below. Let's keep the conversation going. For those of you watching, you'll be getting a link to another episode you might enjoy popping up somewhere right about now. And for those of you listening, check out the YouTube. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and I will see y'all next time.